My mother would have been very proud of that introduction. I'm going to try to live up to that introduction and to the wonderful speakers that I've heard uh, in the last half hour or so, they're really wonderful speeches. Smart justice, that's what I'm going to talk about. San Jose police officer Michael Johnson was shot to death last month as he responded to a suicide threat. So many officers and others came from all over the country to pay their respects that the memorial ceremony was held in the same arena that we hold professional hockey games and major music concerts. It was a sad and stirring ceremony with the theme of sacrifice. The community has risen up in a myriad of ways to help this officer's wife and family soothe, help the officer's wife and family and their fellow officers soothe this trauma. Meanwhile, very discreetly, the shamed family of the slain cop killer facing their own horrific trauma arranged to go to the county's victim services to get some help. This has me thinking about the word victim. Several months ago, I visited San Quentin State Prison and sat in a room among men who had left a wake of destruction in their paths. Murders, armed robberies, sexual assaults. One by one, they told me of their crimes. Then they explained how they were now working together to publish an informative and responsible newspaper called the San Quentin News. Many of them asked how they could go beyond this to help more, how they could somehow give back to a society and a community that they had forsworn and may never be a part of again. This has me pondering about the word perpetrator. On paper, the demographics of a victim and a perpetrator look much the same. Statistics tell us that both are more than likely to be working class or poor, to be minorities, to have experienced violence or trauma as children, to be victims of multiple crimes in the past. Often, the only difference between them is a decision made in a moment in time. The drunk picking up his keys, the addict pondering the empty house, the Sereno slowing as he drives past a rival in red. That terrible decision forever defines them. But in order to make our community safer, we need to challenge ourselves to see more than only this moment in time. We need to be tough and fair. We need to achieve justice, and we need to be smart about what justice is and how we pursue it. Every day, I go to work in a government building housing close to 200 lawyers and 300 support staffers to do the job of justice. On the seventh floor is the homicide team, sixth floor sexual assaults, fourth floor elder fraud, our second floor, Parent Project, a program intended to heal the fraying bonds between family members to lower the odds of truancy and gang membership. Also on our sixth floor, we have a team dedicated to investigating factual claims of innocence, which Lenore referred to our conviction integrity team. Our cold case unit is dedicated to seeking justice and closure for the long-suffering loved ones of crimes that have gone unsolved for years. So every day, as I move up and down in this building between these different floors, I'm working to understand and develop and institute what we mean by the phrase smart justice. In general, my philosophy about smart justice is based on a distinction between the people we are afraid of and the people with whom we are angry. For many years now, we have sent to prison a collection of people who fit both definitions, throwing in dangerous gangbangers along with drug addicts. As a career prosecutor, this is something I did myself. Our system should strive toward focusing our finite resources and energy toward those violent criminals of which we are afraid, and rightly so. As for victims, our system is geared toward an outdated and monolithic definition, and one whose outcome is sympathy-based. The fact is, victims are anyone whose lives have been negatively impacted by crime. All of them should have our sympathy. So let's unite behind the mission that all victims, traditional and non-traditional, need and deserve far more than our heartfelt wishes for healing. They need and deserve tangible help, 
clear and accessible information, safe places to sleep at night, restitution, counseling, and a sympathetic system created to make these things affordable and available. Let's start from there. But there is a resistance to change, not the least of which comes from people inside the system who know more than anybody else about its chronic dysfunction. Some honestly feel that locking up more people will make us safer. Others cynically play upon fear or simply refuse to act because they're politically afraid to try to change. But with or without them, change is happening. So how do we get here to this watershed moment? There's a combination of forces at play. A major factor is, let's face it, money. It's not as cynical as it sounds. While I'm an avowed reformer, I'm also a fiscal conservative. I believe that our efforts to, in our efforts to lower crime, we're wasting and misallocating enormous amounts of money. I expect, and you should expect, far more for the $9 billion we spend on corrections than what we are getting. The expensive housing of thousands upon thousands upon thousands, too many of whom will get out only to return again, too many of whom are people of color, too many of whom, compounded by their own terrible decisions, have been victimized by the terrible decisions of others. So I'm proud to work with organizations like Californians for Safety and Justice to bring to the fore freshly thought out, sometimes counterintuitive efforts at reform and best practices to not only lower crime, but to help victims. And as these programs take hold, violent crime continues to drop. So I'm now looking at how to do things differently to create smarter, better, and more just outcomes. And let me give you just a few examples. Number one, family justice centers. A devastatingly accurate criticism toward the criminal justice system is how uncoordinated it can be for people who truly need help. Imagine a battered woman, shell-shocked and exhausted, trying to schedule appointments with law enforcement, the local district attorney's office, and social services. Where do I sleep at night? What happens to my kids? How do I get a restraining order? Will I be deported? All the questions piling up in her mind. It's our job to answer those questions, and sending her from office to office is unconscionable treatment for a person we are mandated to help survive and then heal. So within the last year, our county's opened two family justice centers, one in the north and one in the south part of our county, for domestic violence victims to get help in one location from a team that includes a police officer, a prosecutor, a victim witness advocate, as well as immigration and family law attorneys. This team of professionals is there to help and coordinate a response that we hope will both ease the trauma and truly shepherd a domestic violence victim toward a better, safer future for her and her family. These two centers are growing, more and more victims are going to them, and more and more people are being helped. Number two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Later this year, we will bring in-house our county's currently subcontracted victim witness services. Why? Because as a program of a DA's office, victim service professionals will now have access to electronic case information to immediately answer victim questions such as court dates and court status updates, which will allow for timely response to Marcy's Law requests. Uh, as well as better assistance in general. In the DA's office, victim advocates will be assigned to prosecution units and will be assigned to cases earlier and more consistently. Finally, in a DA setting, senior advocacy staff and the program manager will be able to offer 24-hour on-call victim advocacy services to provide the most vulnerable victims, particularly homicide victims' families, immediate assistance in the aftermath of a trauma. So, Family justice centers and bringing victim witness services in-house are just two examples of how we're trying to better serve Santa Clara County's traditional crime victims. So let's talk for a moment about non-traditional victims. I believe that many of the most tragic and vulnerable victims in our county, in our state, in our country are undocumented immigrants who are targeted by criminals because they're afraid to reach out to law enforcement to help. So, 
How can we as public servants reach out to immigrants in a time of public vilification and scapegoating? Uh, as one effort, I've instituted a policy called collateral consequences. My prosecutors are tasked to take into account immigration consequences when negotiating settlements of criminal cases. Will a person be at risk of deportation for driving without a license or possessing a small amount of drugs? That would be a disproportionate and unjust result. No person should suffer deportation, shattering a family, increasing the odds that they fail to assimilate, or perhaps even turn to crime or become victims of crime over relatively minor transgressions that to most citizens would mean a fine and some classes. As we hold people accountable for their crimes, we too should be accountable for the consequences of that accountability. It's a good turn of phrase. <laughs> Meanwhile, one of our community prosecutors has launched an ongoing barnstorming tour of Santa Clara County to raise awareness about immigration fraud, hoping to stop notario scammers who take money for the false promise of immigration help. We hope that these efforts and more will break down the barbed wire borders of distrust between immigrants and public safety servants so that we can serve them with the same justice that the rest of us share. The exploitation of the vulnerable is the definition of human trafficking. We are learning to see its victims in a different light. Jolie Harris walked the streets in the middle of the night selling her teenage body for a man who used her like a human ATM. Was she breaking the law? Of course she was. But should she be prosecuted and locked up? Jolie ran away from her sexually and physically abusive home when she was 13 years old. Then a 24-year-old man seduced her and posted her online as though she was a used bicycle. That man is the person we should be focusing our prosecutorial attentions on. So we did. He was prosecuted, convicted, and sent to prison for human trafficking. Our Valor Diversion Program looks to educate and divert sex workers toward a safer life. For Johns, it strives to put a human face to the exploitive criminal industry that they are fueling. Some people do not deserve rap sheets. They deserve remedies. And let's talk for a little bit about propositions. So California is leading the way in figuring out creative ways to reduce its jail population, propelled by financial concerns and a growing consensus that our correctional system works well for almost no one. It does not reduce crime, it does not effectively rehabilitate criminals, nor does it mollify crime victims with a sense of security. Former Sacramento lawyer, Anthony Kennedy, who has since gone on to work for a small boutique firm in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, he's now a Supreme Court Justice, was recently quoted by the New York Times as saying that our criminal justice system was broken. This from a justice of the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court chastised the legal profession for being focused only on questions of guilt and innocence and not what comes after. A little bit of what we heard earlier, only on who are the good guys and who are the bad guys and not how to make everything better. So what comes after is at their ideological hearts what Proposition 36 and 47 were meant to address. I was proud to be one of three district attorneys in the state that helped promote these two ballot reform measures. Now, you should know there's 58 district attorneys in the state, so three is not a lot. Uh, supporting these may not have been the most politically astute positions, uh, but they were smart and just measures. And the people, the voters, saw more clearly than many inside the system who offered dire warnings and few alternatives because it is that front end focus that will ultimately create a California where far less money is wasted, where there's far less racial disparity in our correction system, and where we hope there will be far fewer victims of crime. So let's reallocate our resources on areas that will make a palpable difference, education, rehabilitation, and make sure that there's room for, in prison for the truly dangerous, those we are afraid of and who should remain locked up. 
Now, it is this front end focus that has a group of parents and their children gather together every week to learn how to say, I love you to each other. The parent project is something we run in our district attorney's office. So how's this related to crime prevention? These are families struggling with keeping their kids off of drugs, out of gangs, in school, alive. Moderated by police officers, prosecutors, and others, the DA's Parent Project is intended to strike at the youthful roots of crime. The 12-week program has so far served more than 2,000 families. How many of these children will not cycle through our prisons or end up in our morgues? How many of their victims will wake up tomorrow healthy, healthy and happy? How many of those parents' children will cry at their graduations, not at their funerals? Okay. So we have an idea. Let me tell you about another program that rather than aiming only at punishment, looks towards prevention. My office is proposing to identify criminal defendants with young children and offer them a reduction of their county jail sentence if they agree to participate in the parent project and or enroll their children in first five programs to get their kids on the right track and reduce criminal behavior in the next generation. <laughs> Sounds like a good deal. Our goal is to both reduce the, is both to reduce the current jail population and prevent crime in the group of people studies have shown are the most likely to grow up and commit crimes. And finally, empathy. As we do our jobs, we must never forget to find ways to see the trauma of the men and women who fit the traditional definition of victims. And this starts and ends with empathy. I've been a prosecutor for more than two decades. Many of you have worked in your fields for years and decades. It's easy to resign ourselves to being a small cog in a large machine focused in so closely that our job becomes a series of tasks to be checked off each day. It's understandable, but let's never inure ourselves to the suffering of crime victims. It may be a shoulder for someone to cry on, a carefully crafted restraining order, or a prosecutor who brings a child to an empty courtroom just to show them what it will be like when the trial starts. Let's help each other maintain and reignite the energy and empathy that we had on our first days. Earlier this year, I hired a young man who was a prosecutor in Chicago. One day after work there, he saw gangsters attacking a gay couple. He ran toward the attack, shouting for them to stop. One of the attackers turned and then attacked the prosecutor. As they were fighting, the other gangster stabbed him repeatedly with a broken liquor bottle. Today, that prosecutor comes to work every day wearing a suit that hides the jaggered scars on his body. This is what Deputy District Attorney Jonathan Sasania told me. My experience as a victim gave me the ability to speak from a position of empathy, passion, and urgency. I can use what happened to me to better advocate for other crime victims, both in court and in the way I interact with them. I know how important each and every case is to this victim. I know that they will live with what happened to them for the rest of their lives, and if I can help them give, give them some closure, then every second I spend working for them is worth it. That's my definition of a prosecutor. And so I come back to the words I started with earlier this afternoon. Victim, perpetrator. We have to do better to see these two groups of people as people. People who sometimes fit within both groups people we can help in more ways to keep them out of both groups. That kind of justice, well, that's just smart. Thank you.